memory of my old days of my dad, you know, to be really nasty and drunk, it was a womanizer. Went back to school and kicked the seven shades of out of that bully that was bullying me. Had enough of it and uh, I went back to school as angry as anybody could be, you know, and I went up to him and kicked him and smacked him in the face and he fell over and uh, I kicked him again, you know, and uh, the headmaster wanted to know what it was all about and I said that's why I've been back in school for that crap too, but I'm not putting up with it any longer. Get clear of me after that. They really started myself up. There was one big fella picking on a mate of mine once and I just grabbed hold of him and I lifted him right up over my head and he, he put me down, put me down. It was like a little kid. It was amazing that I could do that training a few times a week. We drew on the walls in the discotheque gravestones and stone crossbones and stuff and wrote the Dreadicus Union and all our names written on on the translucent bright green wall, you know, up there every week. Thought some uh, some of the lads were having a bit of fun at first. I got up and looked round, I couldn't see anybody. Nobody hiding in the bushes in the distance or behind any gravestones. I walked up the slope and I heard it coming directly. It was like in a wonderland, you know, like a miracle happening. It's on his grave and it said, uh, Bronislaw Zapolsky. I always remember that. I was awestruck. It was like an echoing voice, echoing, superimposed upon itself. Couldn't confide in anybody, my mother or son, you or anybody, between me and God. I caught her outside college in Bradford and felt a bit surprised to see me and I walked her home and I was asking her about this person that gave her a lift and she, she wouldn't tell me anything because she thought, uh, she thought, why don't I trust her, you know? And I told her that Mick had seen her two or three days before going on so bigly in the car. I mean, I was, really, I'm going to go, you know, to find out what was going on. And she wouldn't answer. So I thought there was something fishy. She would just, uh, couldn't believe that I'd, I'd doubt her, you know, because she expected me to trust her, you see, and it was like a bull in a china shop. I should have been a bit more casual about it. So that's what led to me uh, uh, thinking she'd been with somebody and and uh, uh, led me to pick a prostitute up in the first place and said, I've changed my mind, I don't want to wanna go through with it. So she said, all right, uh, well, uh, you know, it'll still cost you. I said, I don't mind, uh, but I felt more sort of resentful than ever. And then I felt really bad about um, the situation. I was going to intend just to have sex with somebody so that I wouldn't be blaming Sonia all the time. And uh, I got back home and I was got depression again. And then the voice came for the second time. Well, it, I'd been talking, saying things good for about two years, but this, this time it was giving me advice that wasn't really good, saying that they're the problem in society. Don't you realise what you've had the good advice for two years? It's all been leading up to this. You've got a mission to go on and get rid of these people. So that's how it all started, turned from good advice to bad. So that's when I started on the first attack. Um, with a, a sock and a load of pebbles in it, and it went on the end. It was a clumsy attack, proving it was my first attempt. Because it, it sock burst and the camels flew out all over some parked cars. Just so that you were a prostitute and just uh, attacked. How come you were in a place like that? When you're underage, you said they should have gone to the uh, ballet or the opera, one or the other. And they showed the dad the tickets to go on, so I let him go out. They went round the pub and discotheques instead. She took with me for many, many years, though, before she even thought of... Uh, uh, separation and all credit to her and then even after that when I suggested she find somebody else she still keeps coming to see me so it's really, she really must have uh, loved me a lot most women would have just uh, washed their hands of somebody but she knew me so well in personality and that that she couldn't let go you know I didn't like it because he used to load the tires on the trailer by hand and there were four more trips and you know, all the filthy water sloshing over you as you threw them up onto the truck. Big lorry tires as well, most of them. I thought to the prostitute at first, walking slowly and looking round. 
when I hit her on the head and it, it just it didn't knock her out, it was only a stick. And I threw her over a wall and said, you'll be okay, I'm going. Because I, 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 re I realised that uh, it, she wasn't a prostitute. She, was, I, she seemed fairly young, but I didn't know how young she was. And the, the voice said, no, no, it's a mistake. Stop, stop. So I just said, oh, you'll be all right, I'm going now. And that was it. I ate that title. It didn't apply, it was just a fantasy a nickname that to get the imaginations going. You've got to do everything you can for your mum, bless her, you know. When they've gone, you've lost them then, haven't you? So you often wish, wish I'd said this or done that too late once they've gone. Because, I mean, they bring you up and everything, don't they? Feed you, clothe you, get you to school and everything, you know. And then uh, some people don't care about the parents' condition or whatever, you know. They just ignore them altogether. And, uh, it's not right, is it? Not right. It's important to do as much as you can, you want to get one set of parents, don't you? They saw me attack her from the bedroom window, carried something out, but it was dark, you see. But uh, I thought, oh, I'll stop her, and I, I, I went down the snicky, and he went down the snicky, and went across the road and knocked on the door. He must have thought I'd gone into a house there, but I didn't, you know. But I couldn't let him identify me. Can't argue with God. I, I, I firmly believed on a percent of it. God gave me the instructions to do those things. And I, I believe it's the right thing to be distracting the police and leading them astray. And, oh, I believed it all the time he was protecting the mission, you know. And he kept saying to me, look after the mission. Don't tell anybody or anything. Don't even tell Sonia or your mother between you and your creator. So I told nobody. God was in charge. He was conducting everything and I knew everything would be all right. He misled the police several times and I just knew it was a miracle happening every time, you know.